comics for me were my window into America. I came over with the two traumatized parents uh, who survived the death camps. I was, on the other hand, more uh, able to get comics when I was a little kid than television. It came into our lives later. I'm a baby boom boy, so in the early 50s, television wasn't ubiquitous even, let alone computers and iPhones, but the result was MAD was my window into the world. It's what translated America for me. I used to think that MAD was an acronym for mom and dad. Uh, it was really what introduced me into the ways of the world, of the media, of literature and art, all through that cracked lens of subverting it. So MAD, mom and dad, also, of course, influences you to use your the family life as, as uh, grist for your mill. But I understand that you find writing every bit as easy, perhaps even easier than drawing. Oh, definitely easier. Although I wouldn't say anything is easy, you know. The, the language part of my brain can, like, figure out how to say what it's trying to say and put it together quicker than the uh, right brain that turns it into pictures, usually. So I have enough of a crossover between those two hemispheres to make it into something that is somewhere between writing and drawing. But... Yeah, the writing comes easier. The drawing, I, I torture myself over. In uh, the big word in your work, especially Mouse, is memory about your mother, especially your father. In uh, Meta Mouse, this uh, splendiferous tome here, you have a cartoon character say, I still prowl the murky caverns of my memory, but now I feel like there's a 5,000 pound mouse breathing down my neck. Remembering those who remembered the death camps is a hard act to follow. So Mouse, of course, gives readers a completely different uh, view of Holocaust. But you've always said it isn't a history lesson. I can only be grateful, I guess, that on some level the book is used in schools. I think even in Australia now, which wasn't the case. But in America, it's ubiquitous. From middle school to postgraduate, it's taught. But not always. I've heard that it's taught in uh, courses on the dysfunctional family as well. But it's also used as a, a kind of Auschwitz 101 that I really resist. Because all I was trying to do is retrace my memories and the memories as transferred to me. So the real story of Mouse is not an Auschwitz for beginners, but it's the story of a son trying to understand his father's life, and the son's a cartoonist, so he tries to understand it by putting it in little boxes. I always thought comics were an especially good form for dealing with memory, because you get a bunch of boxes on a page usually. So before you focus on one picture or the other picture, you get a sense of what those pictures are. In a sense, you get the past, the present, and the future when you're looking at a box on that page. You get the boxes that led up to that panel, you see the boxes that are coming, uh, so it allows you to move back and forth in time, which is what memory asks of you. Tell me about your move to San Francisco, because that seems to be, uh, you know, the road to Damascus for you. Well, I was already working as a working cartoonist from the age of 15, so that was before underground comics were around. I was working for a local weekly newspaper. Any place that a mad cartoonist appeared, because they were like the gods, led me ultimately to appear in an anti-Castro magazine before I had any politics of one kind or another, although the guy who did Spy versus Spy was a Cuban refugee. And if he was working for this magazine, by gosh, I would try to work for it also. But my real kind of eye-opening moment was uh, the underground comics that had just started. I was Even before I, I knew what an underground comic was, I was beginning to move in, in that direction. But something cracked open with the work of Robert Crumb and Zap Comics. All of a sudden you had comics that didn't necessarily have punchlines, that were unsavory in their content, let's say, and could deal with issues that had been totally sealed off for that medium before and in a style that was like again the return of the repressed moving back to those 1920s 1930s blue collar bare light bulb bigfoot comics philip ignore his physical proximity and just talk to me directly <laughs> on this this is you know just you and i is it hard to collaborate with this fella i mean there you are you've got the music with your sextet playing live is uh, is he a difficult torval to your dean the work that I've done collaborating with art in certain ways has been one of the easiest collaborations I've had, and in other ways, one of the most difficult. In the easy way, it is that I think we have a lot of interests in common, things that we're interested in exploring and kind of attitudes about things, I guess. The difficulty of it is very detail-oriented. 
even with his books, Art's very concerned about the paper and the ink and the glue. And in a collaboration with a collaborator, we spent a lot of time working on some very, very specific one image, how to, how to tell the story in that image. And in Wordless, because we're doing something to these books that was never originally intended. Like, this is maybe a little sidetrack, but when you write music for a film, the film was always meant to go from the beginning to the end without stopping. So the music follows that supposition. A book is one of the great things about it is you can go backwards and forwards. If you don't understand something, you can flip back a few pages. Once you project that on a screen, you can't flip back anymore. That puts the onus much more on the music to assist in telling the story. So we've worked very hard together to try to get that storytelling between the music and the way the films are animated those two elements, which are the two things that change it from being a book, to do justice to the work and to get the styles right for each individual piece. I never dreamed I was entering into an eight-month project to come over to Sydney and present for an hour and a half. Eight months? Yeah. This project, which is really a fascinating one to me, is presenting something that most people have never seen. These novels told one picture per page uh, and no words, in order to tell stories that deal with social injustice, uh, psychosexual turbulence, subjects that wouldn't have ordinarily been part of comics, from a tradition that's related to a cousin to comics, but not comics, with pictures that are quite beautiful, actually. And I now realize how important they were for me in giving me permission to find a kind of comics that had never been made before. What made it all come back in a more important way is I'd been invited to be the editor of a large two-volume set of uh, an artist named Lind Ward who made these woodcut novels in America starting in 1929. So it wasn't the first, but he was the first Americans ever saw, and in some ways the most sophisticated. The Library of America approached me and said, would you help us edit this and would you write a, a long essay to introduce the set? Now, in a world where graphic novels, at least on my side of the planet, are taken quite seriously and enfolded into the greater cultural endeavor as opposed to existing only at the margins of the anorak crowd, there's now this thing called the graphic novel, and by gosh, there are these people who are making graphic novels in 1929 by eschewing the words, by leaving those out. We, we, before we came into the studio, I was asking you whether you'd ever seen what I regarded as a truly remarkable early animated film called The Idea. Sorry. And it's in your bloody show. Yes, it's the woodcuts of a man named Franz Masriel turned into an animated film with music by Honecker. Yeah. Uh, this fellow Masriel is very central to this wordless presentation because he was the inventor of an important genre of picture storytelling that was taken incredibly seriously back in the day when it first came out. Uh, when Thomas Mann asked what his favorite movie was, he said, the works of Franz Masriel, who didn't make movies except for this half-assed yeah. collaboration. He was yeah. making books, but they were books that had the spirit of the age in them and moved the way silent films move. Somewhere in this book, there's someone says to you that Picasso is uh, into comics. And when I, you know, when I ever I looked at Guernica, I used to always feel that that was right. a fair comic. You know, it took me a long time to look at Picasso, to even listen to Mozart. I was kind of a slob snob. Uh, when I was growing up, I just thought if it wasn't in Mad, it wasn't something I had to pay attention to, uh, that sort of thing. And so it took me a long time to take paintings seriously because they weren't done on newsprint. And he said, this is ridiculous, Art, let me take you to a museum. And then he dragged me to these Picasso pictures and said, just think of them as large comic book panels, damn it, they're really well made. And it, it worked. I became really interested in modernism and it changed my comics and ultimately made me take these woodcut novels seriously because those were artists who were living modernism in the 1920s and 30s. A couple of pages of Mouse. There's an interesting incident that you portray of your father's casual racism. I raise this because uh, you're, you and your wife are in a car with your father and you pick up a black hitchhiker, which makes Dad angry. There's a tendency to think of uh, Holocaust survivors as martyrs and one expects one to be made better by suffering. Suffering makes you hurt. That's all you can say for it. Some people were indeed made more sensitive by what they lived through. Some people were, that part of their self was not touched one way or another. And I wanted to insist that uh, Vladek is not an unsympathetic character, but he isn't 
the character who is made better by going through the crucible of the Holocaust. When I did Mouse, it wasn't part of the popular culture, you know? Like, I started Mouse with a three-page comic in 1972. And at that point, doing research was very hard. There was almost no literature on it in English. I could read everything in English within uh, about a month of interlibrary loans. Uh, it blossomed in the later 70s. Uh, I'd already embarked on Mao's when like, um, that Holocaust TV show happened. Now yeah. there's sort of like a Best Holocaust Movie Award every year at the Oscars or something. It wasn't a genre. When I was working on it, it was just dealing with something I knew that needed to be told and could be told. Well, it's been a great delight to have you both here. Art Spiegelman, artist extraordinaire. Philip Johnson, his saxophonic muse. And we've been talking about uh, wordless. Thanks for coming in. Thanks so Thank much, you, Philip. Philip.